Hi there, I'm Dawn Stover, a research associate with the SFA Gardens on the beautiful campus of Stephen F. Austin State University in Nacogdoches, Texas. Today, we're going to do a little bit of a discussion about houseplants. We all want to brighten our spaces in our residence halls, in our apartments, in our houses, maybe even our offices, and houseplants are a great way to do that. There are many benefits to houseplants, and there's been lots of studies done on them. They've been shown to improve your mood, to improve your productivity. Could you imagine a plant helping you study better? It's been proven. They can reduce your stress, and they also improve the air quality in the space that you're in. Today, we'll talk a little bit about the easiest houseplants for you to grow, the ones that you should get started with if you're a novice plant grower. Um, during the, the times of COVID, um, houseplants and gardening in general has become a very, very popular thing because it's such a great way to relieve stress and just look at something beautiful and pretty. I've gone a little bit crazy with my houseplants in, in my house and um, my husband has yet to tell me to stop buying houseplants, so I'm going to keep on going until he says, you know, it's time to quit. But if you're starting out, the easiest plant to grow is um, what I would call a mother-in-law's tongue, but these days um, the common name is called a snake plant. And there's lots of different varieties of snake plants. There's this little, small, variegated one. There's this neat cylindrical species that kind of grow, grows sort of in a tubular shape. You sometimes see these braided and that's kind of interesting too. And then you have the bigger varieties like this guy right here. And this one will probably get to be another six inches taller or so. So you need to have a good space for that. Um, the second easiest thing to grow in my opinion would be a pothos ivy. And there's lots of different color foliage patterns on the pothos. This is one called pearls and jade. Um, there's bright sort of chartreuse ones. There's just plain old green ones. Um, so there's a, there's a pothos ivy for anybody. Sometimes it's called a devil's ivy. A very, very close relative to the pothos ivy is the philodendron. You can kind of see it has a similar growth habit. It's sort of vining. This particular one um, is a beautifully bright yellowish chartreuse green color. And I like that, especially contrasted with this other easy to grow called the ZZ plant. So you can see the contrast between the dark foliage of this one's called Raven um, and the bright yellow in this flower. This is a relatively new plant to me. It's called the ZZ plant. Um, both the, the, the scientific names, the genus and the species both start with Z. They're a tongue tangle, so I'm not even going to attempt to try to pronounce it. Um, this is a beauty called Raven. Usually they're a real pretty bright um, kind of Kelly dark green. And this one's sort of a dark purple, um, almost black. All of the plants that I just mentioned are fairly good in low light situations. Um, another plant that I've found that's very easy to grow is the Monstera. Now this is just a leaf from my plant at home because it's a fairly large plant. Um, and there's also a smaller um, cousin to that. This one's called Little Swiss. It sort of looks like Swiss cheese there. Um, I found they're very easy to grow, but they do like a little bit more of a brighter light situation. Let's talk a little bit about light. When you buy your plants, especially from a reputable source like um, some mail order companies or um, your, your big box um, hardware stores or even your grocery store, a lot of times they'll have um, the name tag in it. And this is important so that you can look up and see how much water, how much light, how much humidity, and sometimes they even tell you how often to apply fertilizer. The biggest thing we want to kind of keep in mind is light situations. Sometimes the plants will require low light and the best way that I can describe low light is if you have no um, external lights on other than your windows and, and things like that that let in natural light. If you can read a book in that situation, that's a low light situation. Um, if you have medium light, then your plant will cast um, a light shadow 
and if you have highlight, it will be a very prominent dark shadow. So that's kind of uh, the best way that I've, I've ever read to um, describe um, your light situation. So most of these plants that we talked about are, are low to medium light plants. Um, I, I actually have um, a pretty highlight situation, and they do well in that situation too. If you don't, if you only have one tiny little window in your residence room, your residence hall room, or if you um, have a north-facing um, apartment and you don't have a lot of natural light, you can actually supplement that with um, artificial lights. Um, if you have a full-spectrum LED light that you can put into any lamp or light fixture. Or you can even buy um, special bulbs or special lamps created for this particular situation. So there's really no reason why you can't grow a plant in a dark situation. You just have to add a little bit of supplemental light. Just remember that your plants need a little bit of a break, just like we do every night. So turn your, turn your lights off at least six to eight hours every day. And then you can turn it on um, during the day while you're awake too. Let's talk about water. Um, the watering inconsistencies and watering incorrectly are the fastest and best way for you to kill your house plants. Um, most of the questions that I field about house plants, what's wrong with my plant? It looks like it's dying. And I first thing I ask is how often that you water. And people generally tell me, well, I water every Saturday, or I water, you know, you know, very frequently, or it, it and that's. That's just not the way to do it. You have to let your plants tell you when it's time for you to water them. And the easiest way to do this is very, very scientific. It's called the finger test. And so if you take your finger and you stick it in your plant until the second knuckle, and if it feels damp or moist, do not water your plant. Um, if it feels dry up to your second knuckle, then it's time to water your plant. You have to be real careful in, in some of your containers. If you're watering directly in your, into your container and you don't have drainage holes, your plant can tend to sit in water. So um, most of my plants I keep in really ugly pots and then, and then tuck them into pretty containers. If I can take that and if I can pour water out, that's too much water for my plant. That's a very, very good indication. Um, more often than not, when I water my plants, I will take them out of their container. I'll take them over to the kitchen sink and take them out of their container and water until I see water coming through. Now let it drain a little bit and put it back into its container. And that's sufficient. And I'm not going to check that. I might, I might check it every every now and then, but I'm not going to water just because it's Saturday or if it's Friday night or, or I'm bored. I'm going to water when the plant needs water. Okay, let's talk a little bit about decorative containers. Um, way back in the day when house plants were popular back in the 1970s when your parents and grandparents were, were gardening indoors, um, we didn't have all the pretty containers that we do today. Um, I really like them because they serve several purposes. One, um, you can hide the container that it's in. And two, it serves to protect the surface that you put your plant on. So if you have this sitting on you know, your, your bookshelf or your windowsill or, or something, you don't want that moisture sitting next to, especially any kind of wood um, product. So what I like about these is that I can, I can water these. Even if I did overwater it, this container is going to hold all of that moisture in. And of course, then you can also use it for decorative purposes too, um, making everything look pretty. If you do decide to pot your plant directly into the decorative container, you have to be very careful that it has a drainage hole. Um, I like the ones these days because they actually have a little plug that you can take in or out. So you can make that choice whether you want it to drain or whether you don't. Because I'm not potting directly into that container, I'm going to leave that, that little plug in there and just put my pot that does have drainage holes into that decorative pot. Very, very important that your plant has drainage. Um, if you're using something like a basket, what I'll do is I'll find 
a saucer that fits inside of there. That way it catches the moisture in the water and it doesn't go through the basket to my hardwood floors or, or wherever I have it sitting. So that's good easy ways to cheat and keep things pretty and keep your, your hard surfaces safe. One thing people tend to be concerned about um, with houseplants is that they might be toxic to pets. And it's quite true that many houseplants are in a family that is toxic to pets and to humans. If you have, um, if you have pets that tend to chew on things or if you have small children that tend to put things in their mouth, um, it's really, really important that you keep up with that plant label so you know what's toxic and what's not. It may or may not say it on the label, but with that name in hand, you can go online and look up to see if things are toxic. <clears throat> A lot of things um, like the monstera, like the, the philodendron and the pothos ivy, if you, if you ingest them, they cause a, a great deal of irritation. It m might not necessarily kill your animal, but it would um, make it sick and make it very, very uncomfortable. Um, you just have to make that decision for yourself. I have to tell you that with my crazy houseplant collection, I also have three dogs and two cats. And I don't worry about it because they're not, they're not chewing on anything. If I saw signs of that, then I would just put the plants um, out of reach or I would put them in a different room where the animals don't have access. Houseplants are actually some of the easiest plants to propagate. Um, many of them can be divided and many of them can be um, rooted from cuttings. I took a real pretty glass um, decorative container and I took a, this is my golden pothos ivy, and I just took some stem cuttings and stuck them in the water and they've made roots for me. I like the way it looks, so I'll probably keep it in that drawer for a, a, a while. Um, if you wanted to share it with friends, or if you wanted just to, you know, create more plants for your house, you could pot it into soil. Um, some people are a little more careful with that than I am. Um, some people like to gradually introduce the soil to the water. I go whole hog and just put it right into soil. Now, the houseplants might live forever, but they won't live forever in the teeny tiny pots that you purchase them in. Um, I have a really great fiddle leaf fig, and I've started noticing some issues um, on the leaves, some little spots on the leaves. And so, because I know what this is, I, I saved the tag. I did some online research, and what I, I read is that I'm not consistently giving this plant enough moisture. We talked about overwatering your plants, but you can also underwater your plants. Um, really good way for you to know if your plant is needs to be transplanted is if you have to water it much more frequently than you would other plants. Um, On here, you can see that this this soil is super super dry. Um, it's very light colored, which means it's dried out, and you can also see that there are roots coming out of the bottom of the pot. And this is a sure sign that your plant is ready to graduate to a bigger pot. So let's talk a little bit about how to make your plants um, happy when you transplant them into bigger pots. Um, we have our fiddle leaf fig here with the roots coming out of the bottom. Now the hardest part to transplanting this is basically matching your ugly pot to fit inside your pretty pot. That's the hardest part that I have because it's hard to find nursery pots in a retail setting. Um, I found this little little two gallon size pot and it was a little too big for my decorative container that I purchased for this so I cut the lip of that black pot down just a little bit. Now you'll notice we talked a little bit about drainage holes earlier. You'll notice that this has good drainage holes in this, and so when I pot my plant, the water's gonna drain freely out of there. And I want it to be just a little bit bigger than the plant um, that where the pot that it's currently in. If you go too big, that's oftentimes detrimental to a lot of house plants, especially pothos ivy. If you overpot them, that's a sure way to kill them. Now I'm gonna take a good um, clean potting soil. Um, I don't reuse potting soil when I'm potting fresh, um, fresh plants. Um, most garden centers will sell different types of soil and you can look for one that's, that's um, sold specifically for house plants. You want a lot of peat in there because peat's very uh, moisture retentive and that's kind of important for our house plants. 
Um, this one has a, a little bit of bark and a little bit of perlite um, to help with drainage, um, and that's okay too. And sometimes, sometimes the soil comes charged with a little bit of fertilizer, and that's all right as well. So I'm going to put a little bit of soil in my pot, in my new pot, and then I'm going to check the depth. I don't want the top of the soil in the current pot to be sticking up above this pot of the new pot and I don't want to be sticking way 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 down there so I'm going to I'm going to kind of check it and see and continue to put the new soil in the pot until it's right about the right depth then here's the scary part you've got to take it out of here so you grab it by the by the crown right here right by the soil and you just pull it if your pot is super 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 root bound destroy the pot, save the plant. Um, this one's not too terribly root bound so I don't have to cut this pot apart and that's good. At this point I, I want to break this root ball up just a little bit. If this plant had been a lot more root bound the roots would start to circle and we don't want it to circle. We want it to kind of grow throughout the planter and so I'll, I'll just break that up just a little bit. If they were really really root bound I might take a serrated knife and make some cuts along the edges that way the roots um, are able to kind of break free and grow through to the new container. I might rough it up a little bit on the sides too. Like this plant's not terribly root bound so I don't have to do a lot with that. At this point I'm going to use my non-dominant hand, my left hand, I'm a righty. Um, I'm going to put the plant where I want it. I'm going to hold it where I want it in the new pot. So you can see that the level of the soil is, is current with the level of the lip of this pot right here. And I don't, I don't need to put any more soil under here. I did a good job of filling the bottom. But then I need to tuck some soil in around the sides. And I'm just going to work all the way around. And um, I like to use the term tuck. Um, when I'm teaching students, I often find them doing this. That's packing. That's not tucking. And so we don't want to pack in because roots do need air too. And when you pack the soil like that, that removes the, the air space. So we're just going to try this, start over, try it again, and tuck gently. Until you have a, a nice, good, even soil surface with the top of that pot. I don't want to, I don't want to pile the soil up above, above the lip of that pot because when you water it's just going to make a big old mess and so that's why I sort of smooth it down. Okay at this point I would probably add a little bit of slow release fertilizer. Um, we use a brand called Osmocote. There's there's other brands on the market. There's some generic brands on the market but um, just a general slow release fertilizer is fine. They come in little kind of like pebble like um, granules. Um, you can also fertilize your house plants with liquid feed but I tend not to do that um, too often. I'll, I'll start um, fertilizing in spring um, and summer when the plants are really actively growing. And I always dilute the recommended re uh, rate of fertilizer in half for house plants. They're not outdoors, they're not he heavily respiring, um, so they don't need a real heavy food. And oftentimes, I really honestly forget to feed my plants. And they'll tell you when they're hungry. They'll tell you when they start to turn a, a very light shade of green. They say, I'm, I'm hungry, you need to give me a little bit of food. But in our little fiddly fig, at this point, I would take it and I would water it in really well until the, the water ran through the pot out of the drainage holes. And then I'd put it in my decor, decorative container and place it in my house. Now, feel free to visit us at the SFA Gardens from dawn until dusk, seven days a week. We're always open. We have more than 100 acres on the SFA campus of beautiful gardens and trails for you to safely socially distance and enjoy the outdoors. So um, bring, your, bring your horticulture inside and take yourself outside and visit the horticulture here.